you turn to Romans 10.10, God has given us a word about confession. A word about confession, Romans 10.10. Everybody should know that by heart. For with the heart man believeth, with the mouth he makes confession unto receiving. Now that's a faith principle, certainly not to be limited to merely confessing Christ as Savior. Of course, that is what he mentioned there. With the heart you believe unto righteousness, with the mouth you make confession unto receiving the righteousness of Christ or your salvation. So we can't overemphasize the importance of both believing and confession. While it needs to be pointed out that we can't overemphasize the importance of confession, it also needs to be pointed out that you can't separate your confession of faith from your faith. Now, what I mean by that is this, that there are a lot of people who can make a good confession of faith, but they don't have the faith they're confessing to. They make a good confession because it's in line with the word, but they don't have the faith in their heart they're confessing to. And if you'll notice here, there are two things required to receive from God. He didn't say just to believe or just to confess. And I wish you would look at the verse because... It will save me a lot of work in the future having to go over the ground with people I counsel with from this body. Do you see it there? Two things. If, and they're both conditioned with if, you do something. If you believe in your heart and if you confess with your mouth. Now, it's a relatively easy thing for you to confess with your mouth. What prevents you? From confessing with the mouth. Nothing. People are making confessions about Christ who are not saved because he said many will call me Lord, Lord. They made a good confession. But their deeds didn't match their words. So it's easy to confess with your mouth, but if the faith you're confessing to is in your head and not your heart, then you're just confessing mere words. You don't meet the condition that's required to receive. If you believe in your heart and if you confess with your mouth. Well, anybody can confess, but not everyone is believing. And as I say, if everyone was believing, our ministry would be relatively easy. Not that it's a job or work, but some people make it hard, harder than it needs to be because they do confess and they hear a message of faith or they'll sit under a faith ministry and they know how to confess because they get it in line with the word and because Though we say it again and again, they've not seen the difference between head and heart faith. They don't understand why they're not receiving or why it doesn't happen to them like it does to you because they say, I believe and I confess. You see, the confusion in so many people's minds is that head faith is just as sincere and genuine as heart faith. It's just in the wrong location to receive the promises of God. He didn't say believe with your head because Judas believed with his head. Thomas believed with his head and his eyes. He said, I'll believe it if I see it, but if I don't, I won't. But that is sincere faith, often in the head. But it's in the wrong location. But these people are just as sincere and they don't understand, you know, well, why didn't I receive? They'll say, I believed it, I confessed it, and I still didn't receive it. Which, of course, is a contradiction, as those at Faith Assembly know by now. That, that was an utter contradiction they just stated. I believed it and didn't receive it. You can't believe anything you don't receive. You can't believe you have it if you don't have it. That's nonsense. That's double talk. But you see, head faith, while it's sincere, is in the wrong location. And head faith can be argued out of you. And those, and many do, they get talked out of their faith and then they get led astray are turned off of the end time faith message because they found somebody with a bigger head, more head, greater head, more intellect, better arguments. See, head faith can never overcome a better head. And there's always somebody with a better head than yours. And they're in the pulpits. And they got the Holy Ghost. And sometimes they say they're faith teachers and ministers. And they'll tell you, now, I've got a better head, let me show you. Oh, divine healing, it's true, but don't do anything foolish because God heals through those unregenerate doctors and those 
hospitals and the miracle drugs. Don't try to tell God how to supply the money you've claimed, the 5000 you need, because if you can get it from the bank or the finance company, well, then this is the way God's supplying it. Who are you to say, Lord, I want it to fall down out of heaven or whatever? So they make it sound so ridiculous, you go down and borrow it on the day before the deadline closes. Or you should take your drugs and medicines while you pray. Oh, we believe in prayer. Or they will come with that logical argument based upon misunderstanding of the Word of God and the theology of the Word of God and say, well, you can't claim someone else's salvation. That interferes with the sovereignty of God. That interferes with the free will of the person. And if you're not grounded in the Word of God, in fact, if you don't know something, dear friends, besides are more than most that I meet know, a person with a better head can talk you out of your head faith. But they can talk you out of your heart faith because you've already experienced it. It's already happened. You're not waiting to get healed. You're not waiting for the 5,000. You're not waiting for those loved ones to be saved. It was done at Calvary. And heart faith enters into that work by a confession of what you need. So head faith is no better than your head. Head faith can be overcome by logic, by rational intellectual argument. You know why? It's because that's where head faith itself is located, in the head. I mean, head faith can be overcome by an intellectual argument because that's where head faith is located, in the intellect. I mean, the head is designed to listen to something that is appealing to the intelligence, that sounds right or logical. That's why, dear friends, we keep saying, certainly faith appears as foolishness even to most charismatics. Faith does. Not what they're teaching, it doesn't. But faith does. A confession of faith is mighty important. It's of vital importance if we're to receive the promises of God. But if the faith you're confessing is only in your head and not your heart, we're saying it isn't going to work just because you're confessing. You can just confess until you turn blue in the face. You have to catch your breath so you can confess again, but you're not going to get anything because you're confessing. The condition is believe in your heart, and that's where the faith comes from that you're confessing to. Now, we don't mean the physical heart. We mean when the faith is in you. That power that you have to say, I will or I won't. That's where it resides. Now, with that in mind, then we come to Romans 10.10, 10, seeing that what he said here shows that Christianity is not just something we believe, but something we confess. If we understand about where confession should come from, the heart and not the head, and how that confession can be just as sincere out of the head as out of the heart, and that isn't the problem. You have to find out where it's located, what you're confessing. Once you see that, then we see that confession itself is of vital importance. Because Christianity isn't just something you believe. Jesus pointed that out when he said in Matthew 10, it's not just a person who believes, but he that confesses me that's saved. And that's what is said here in Romans 10, 10, that you've got to believe and confess. In Mark eleven twenty three, he says we can have what we confess. Why? Because what you confess is your faith in utterance, faith speaking. You can locate a person's faith by what they testify to, what they talk about, what they say. That's right. You can locate their faith or their lack of it, but what they're saying. And if you'd wake up to that, you could listen to yourself sometimes and discover, well, wait a minute. That isn't in line with the word, what I just said. No wonder I don't feel any better. No wonder that my husband is further from being saved than before. Listen to what I'm saying when I'm not confessing some promise I'm reading out of the book. Oh, you can make a good confession in line with the book, and then if the rest of the day a wife isn't submissive, isn't trying to win him with a meek spirit, if she's being overbearing, she isn't going to win him because the other thing she's saying negates what she's saying when she's confessing in line with the Word. So a confession of faith isn't standing before the church and saying, I confess faith in Christ. That's good. It can begin there, but a confession is what you testify to. We can locate your faith by what you say, or lack of it. Like a woman came after I had just taught along this line on positive thinking and confession. She came up and said, I've got a real need and I need an answer. I've got a question I have to ask you. But she says, I know I'm going to say the wrong thing. She said, I know after that message I'm going to confess the wrong thing to you. <laughs> well, I said, yes, you just did. <laughs> I said, you're stopped right there. You've already defeated yourself. 
I mean, friends, <laughs> you wonder why a person after listening to an hour and a half on positive confession, but Lord, when he first gave me this end time message, end time ministry, he cured me of all the tendency to be naive or to be overly optimistic about people in meetings because he showed me right away that after you preach a message, they'll meet you at the door saying to you things that reveal they weren't even there, and yet they were there. So you have to learn to be patient. I just preached my heart out one time on positive confession, another place. Watch what you confess. You're going to get that disease you're confessing, or it's going to stay with you or whatever. And I was walking down to the pulpit, and one woman said to another, said, where's your husband tonight? Isn't he coming to the meeting? He was there the previous night. He heard positive confession too. She said, oh, no, he can't make it. He's got his old pneumonia back. It's his. He gets it every year, ever so often. It belongs to him. After an hour, hour and a half preaching on positive confession. So you get up there and believe God, the anointing won't leave because you're believing that's the only one, that person sitting there who said that, that the rest of them got the message. Well, anyway... She said, I know I'll confess the wrong thing to you. I said, that's right, you just did. Amen. We can locate you. You can locate us by what we say. People finally get tired asking me, how do you feel? How are you? I've had people say, no point asking you. You always get the same answer. Do you always feel good? Do you never had a pain or anything? I didn't say that. I didn't say that. But I watch my confession. I've been going through trials at times when they'd say, how are you? I'd say, rejoicing in the Lord, rejoicing in Jesus. His word is true. His word is true and he's true to his word. See all that positive confession? They said, how do you feel? I want to know how you feel. I'd say, it's none of your business. <laughs> but I'm rejoicing in the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. So... Another thing to keep in mind about this confession is that you should do what very few do. We should do it here at Faith Assembly, all of us, and that is to confess to all that God has done for us. We should confess, our confession should involve, should encompass not just one or two aspects of what we know or we've experienced, but the whole realm of what God has done in us and through us and what he wants to do with us. I mean, a lot of people can make a good confession about John 3.16. I know I'm saved, faith in Christ. They make a good biblical confession, but that's about all they confess. Most in the churches, you know that. That's the limit of their confession. Some you can't even get that out of. Them. But a lot of people in the church can make that confession. You shouldn't just confess about your faith in the resurrection or faith in healing, but let your confession encompass all that he's done, all that he plans to do, all that he's provided so that the world and the church and the devil will be able to identify you as a son of God, as a joint heir with Christ. A confession isn't a confession just to get up occasion and say, well, I want to make a good confession. I got this or that out of the Lord because I believe. But I want to give you in this message this morning, and all that was introduction to say it, seven steps to victorious faith through confession. Seven steps to victorious faith through confession. We need to confess what we are in Christ, where we are in Christ, what we have in Christ, what we can do in Christ, what we know in Christ, where we're going with Christ, the whole bit, a whole lot of things. Confession of all these things will bring you into a realm of faith and victory that the person who just confesses when he gets something occasionally or confesses to one or two truths he knows or he has experienced will never reach that place. Now, first of all, we need to confess, and some of you ought to write it down somewhere, and then you won't be confessing the wrong things to me up here. But some of you need to get it down. This is a charismatic teaching center, and pencils and pens and papers and Bible margins, they're invaluable in the right location when you use them at the right time. All right, confess what you are. Half the people I know are defeated because they're afraid or don't know to confess what they are in Christ. This has to do with your standing. Confess what you are in Christ. Well, what are you? This is your standing. What are you? Second, 
Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, we're going to confess what we are in Christ. If any man be in Christ, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, not a new creature, a new creation. Old things. You know how to spell old, O-L-D. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Oh, praise God, we got a lot of amens. And I trust every amen was valid. <laughs> because it's easy to confess. And I encourage your amens. That is what I'm saying. But watch it, because some of the amens out of this church, I'm hunting the people. I've lost their address. They don't come anymore. <laughs> when he said old things are passed away, he was not simply referring to your old sins that have passed away. That's where the church limits him in his atonement. But when he said old things are passed away, he said all things are become new. That means all the old things had to pass away if all things have become new. That means sin and sickness and defeat and worry and frustration and poverty and failure and oppression and everything that was old. Hallelujah. All things, he says here, have become new. Now all things will pass away. All the old things will pass away. And all things will become new to the extent that you know and believe and confess and act on what your standing is in Jesus Christ. Your standing in him is as that a new creature. But it isn't going to happen just because you confess it. Because multitudes, Christians are in the churches, and I'm including charismatics in most of my messages. I hope I don't have to keep saying it every time. Multitudes are confessing 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, old things passed away, all things become new, and they're still living all the old things. Old things have not passed away. All things have not become new, though they're confessing it, and so confessing it doesn't bring it to pass. They're still living the same old poverty-stricken, defeated, frustrated lives that they did before. And you know that by looking at them and listening to them. They make a good confession on 2 Corinthians 5.17 because it's in line with the word. That's a good confession. But their faith doesn't match their words. They don't believe and act on what they said they were in Christ. New creatures. <coughs> oh, you can just go into any church in the land, almost without exception, Pentecostal to Episcopalian. You just hear people testifying they're old creatures. But they make a good confession when they're quoting the word. You know why? Their face's in their head and not their heart. Face in the head. It's all in the intellect. No, we're to make our deeds match our words and then it'll be true what the Word of God says about us. Now that isn't the only place where we have a good confession we ought to make where we're told, where we're given the assurance that we're complete, have everything in Jesus. In Colossians 2.10, we read that we are complete in Jesus. All right, I'll ask you how many people you know, including yourself. You ought to include yourself in all of this. How many people do you know who are complete in Jesus? Well, they wouldn't dare confess it, most of the people you know. They're not complete. They're still living lives that are incomplete. Incomplete in faith, incomplete with respect to health, incomplete with respect to finances, incomplete with respect to to victory, incomplete in every way. I mean, just confessing that you're complete in him. All because you don't believe what he says, you see. Merely confessing will not enable you to possess it. It's not enough just to confess with the head when it's not in the heart. It's obvious most Christians are not complete in Jesus. Now, it's true as far as their legal standing is concerned, but like the prodigal or like the elder brother, they're not living up to what their standing is in Christ. They're quoting passages setting forth their standing. They're quoting passages which say, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. They're quoting passages which say, I am complete in him. But merely saying it, if it isn't true, in your experience, isn't going to make it come to pass. Acting in faith on what your standing is and confessing faith in your standing these things are inseparable. What I'm saying is we've got to get our confession, even though it's a good one often, out of our head into our heart. 
And it isn't going to come by confessing at once. Some things, one confession is enough to receive. But generally, and especially in this hour when God is preparing sons to manifest and sons to go into victory in battle, sons that he's preparing for end time ministry, sons are going to have to learn to hold fast to their positive confession of faith in many things they claim and believe in until they see the manifestation. And as someone said just the other day, visiting us, said, you know, some of the things, people don't realize this, some of the things may be manifested the day before Jesus comes, and it's only those who hold fast that when he comes, is he going to use in end time? Hallelujah. I said, yes, and there just may be something happen when the shout goes out. And the last trump sounds. You can't set time. We're talking to overcomers. We're not talking to people that say, well, uh, who wants to hurt for a week when you can take a pill, get a shot, and be on your way? I've had people say that to me. Well, I just tell them, forget faith, forget the end time message, and forget the end time ministry. We're talking to people that'll pay the cost. We've got to get our confession out of our head into our heart. You can make a good confession, but it's head faith. Somebody said, I confessed that once and it didn't happen. Then I say, confess it twice. Oh, I confessed it must have been six times. Six times, confess it twelve. Hold fast your confession. Well, how long are we supposed to confess? I said, if faith isn't from your head to your heart when you've confessed it a hundred times, confess it two hundred, three hundred, four hundred, five hundred. I don't care how long you confess it because the word of God is true. He says, faith comes by hearing the word of God. And if you keep hearing yourself confess the word of God, faith has to come. Now, it doesn't always come because someone gives up his confession of faith. Confessing it once is about the limit of most people's capacity. They've got very limited capacities. It didn't happen right away. Must mean he's wrong, I'm wrong, we missed it, not for today, whatever. Confess it till it happens. I mean, the example of Dr. Yeoman's experience illustrates this perfectly. How she as a medical doctor was saved and baptized in the spirit and saw the truth of divine healing and so instead of treating people with medicines, she did what is logical for a nurse or a doctor to do is to start using their skills in the realm of faith. Faith skills, which is just, you know, the oil laying on of hands. Those are skills. Not everybody has them. Well, praise the Lord. I have people come here practically every week. One woman said, been a nurse 10 years. Said, tomorrow's my last day. Praise the Lord. I've had people, more than one in this body, said, well, I've been a nurse for years. The reason men don't give up medicine and so on, it's pride. They spent all that years and a lack of faith in one realm because they're not sure God can provide for them. Now, I'm not knocking charismatic doctors. I know a number of them, but I'm saying, and this is the first time I've said it, but it's good to say it, that if they'll go all the way, they'll get out of medicine. There are enough doctors out there to treat this suffering humanity. And the one doctor in Georgia that we have his tract here, he's getting out as quickly as he can. He's already preaching. He has a radio program. He preaches the faith message. And just as soon as the Lord can sever the ties in his own time and way, he's out. And he's just chafing at the bit. They're under, he and his wife are under great strain just to be staying there treating these unbelieving charismatics. So they have people come for miles to be treated by this good Christian doctor and he's trying his best to get out of it. But anyway, Dr. Yeomans went into the right kind of medical practice and that is faith and anointing with oil and she set up a home where she only took the terminal patients, those that were given up to death. She had a program, and it was to read them the word, get the word into their heart. Faith comes by hearing the word, and get them to confess the word. They say, confess it, it'll get out of their head into the heart, and they'll possess it. And she tells in one of her books about one woman that was carried in, a tubercular patient, totally helpless, dying in the last stages, and put her in a room upstairs, and in due time she came to her and sat down and explained it to her how that God would heal her if she would believe it, but it took faith in the word of God. And it took a positive confession. So she read her the word of God, the passages on healing. One of the passages she read was this, I want you to confess that I'm not under the curse. See, Jesus, Galatians 3, has delivered us from the curse. Oh, Christians, we've got news for you. Even you charismatics, wherever this message goes, we've got good news for you. You're not under the curse. 
when they cut you half and two with that surgical knife, you're still under the curse. You're under the knife. That's the curse. That hurts. I felt that. Don't have to feel that anymore, praise God. But I was one of those characters who couldn't take pain medicine. And I had to suffer through it. I mean, I was cut half and two once to take kidney stones out. I discovered they cut you half and two. They never operate on both kidneys at once. You'd be in two parts. The pain medicine's worse than the pain. To me, it was. And I just had to suffer. But praise God no more. You know what it is to come out from the drug they give you to put you to sleep and then can't take pain medicine and you're cut half and two? Well, you don't want to experience that. So I would lie there, but I don't have to do that anymore. Well, she left her with this. You're not under the curse. She said, I want you to confess that every time you think of it. Confess it time after time. Get that out of your head into your heart. Well, she said, I don't understand this. She said, it doesn't matter, confess it. So the next day she came in, read her the word. She said, are you confessing what I told you? Oh, yes, I must have confessed it 10,000 times. Still don't understand it. She said, it doesn't matter, keep confessing it. Keep confessing it. Amen. Church is filled with people who don't understand the simple healing message. So I tell them, confess it, confess it, confess it. Some will get three or four confessions out and then they give it up. But if you can get them to confessing it, it'll get out of their head into their heart. Faith comes by hearing the word. I get faith when I hear the word coming out of me because faith comes by hearing the word. I don't care who's preaching it. That's one reason I don't listen to tapes. I get so involved in what a blessing I'm getting, I'd never get anything else done. I don't listen to my tapes. I mean, I don't care what that sounds like. It's true. Faith comes by hearing the word. If you can't get blessed by your message, change your message. So she said, yeah, I've confessed it a thousand times. Don't know what it means. He said, keep confessing it. And she said a couple of days later, Dr. Yeomans was down in the kitchen fixing herself a cup of coffee when she heard feet bounding down the steps. This woman, dying woman, you know, helpless bedfast. Woman rushed in. Dr. Yeomans, Dr. Yeomans, do you know, do you know I'm not under the curse? <laughs> Hallelujah. Got out of her head into her heart. And she was totally healed. I mean, like instantly. Yes. Keep on confessing the word. Make a good confession. Confess what your standing is in Christ as a son of God. That means you're not under the curse. He isn't under the curse. We're joint heirs with him. We're called sons of God. He's delivered us from the curse. So confess what your standing is if you want that faith to get out of your head into the heart. And I say this in love, though it sounds repetitious, you would have to ask a lot less questions if you just confess a little more to him and to the world and to the devil about your standing in Christ. Amen. Now, another confession. Another confession. We're talking about seven steps to victory through positive confession. Confess what you are, now confess where you are in Christ. This is your position. First was your standing, confess what you are, now confess where you are in Christ. This is your position. Well, where are you? <laughs> well, he said, I'm seated here at Faith Assembly, Glory Bar. I'm out there in the car, listening over the loudspeaker. See, we know you're out there, we're talking to you too. The Lord wants to bless you in the cars downstairs, wherever you are. Where are you? Down there, over there, up here. You're not here. <laughs> Ephesians 2, 5, and 6 says that Jesus has ascended into the heavenlies and we have ascended with him. We are seated together with him in the heavenlies. Hallelujah. That's where we are. Hallelujah. As to your position, that's where you are, your spiritual position. And where is that in the heavenlies? Chapter 1 and chapter 6, if you take them with chapter 2, it says you're seated far above all the principalities and powers of darkness. Amen. Above all those. You have authority over all those. And as we said in a message just recently, most Christians don't know what their position is, not even charismatics know, because they're living like the elder brother in a midst of plenty as sons of God in the kingdom and they're living like the elder brother. They're more a prodigal than the prodigal. Feeding on the husks of man's religion. Down in the hog pen are feeding on the husks of man's religion when they could be enjoying a feast from the word of God. Oh, the word of God's a feast. All of these beautiful 
assurances and promises are love letters from a heavenly father to his children saying, here's how I love you. I don't want you to be sick, poverty stricken, worried, fearful, your family lost, whatever. I don't want you to be a failure in the ministry. I want to bless you. I want to see you bear fruit. Feeding on the husks of man's teaching when they could be enjoying a feast from the word of God. Listening to their elder brothers tell them what's not for today. Elder brother was living in the midst of plenty and saying, I don't have this, I don't have that. And his father, Piper the Heavenly Father, said, you don't have anything. He said, it's yours. Everything's yours. All you have to do is ask. In fact, he didn't even have to ask. All he had to do was take. Now, Jesus is trying to say something in that parable. Amen. People sometimes get jealous of us like he did because the Lord is blessing us so much. I just tell them it's because God loves us more than he does you. <laughs> and then when you get their attention, <laughs> you say, no, the word says he's no respecter of persons. He's just a respecter of faith. The reason you don't have it, you don't believe it. You're telling God, I don't believe you. You're listening to your elder brother tell you it's for the past or the future. It's for over there. Everything's for over there. Baptists, it's over there. Presbyterians, it was for the Jews. Methodists, it was for the Jews and in the future. But it's not here, it's over there. Someone once wrote a song, over there, over there. Some charismatic ought to sit down and let the Spirit guide them in a song, over here, over here. <laughs> All these promises I read are for over here. Over here, over here. The blessings of God are for over here. Now you can take that on. Praise the Lord. I can, al I can almost, almost put the cords to it and sing it now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Over here, over here. Tell the people it's for over here. <laughs> Hallelujah. And on and on and on. Amen. That's what my Bible says. It's over here. The promise is for over here. I won't need healing over there. Revelation 21 tells me there's no sickness, no pain, no death, no tears over there. He bore your sicknesses and pains for over here. Hallelujah. Oh, I won't need to believe for a new car over there to get me to the meeting or to work. Because I won't need a new car. I'll have a new body. I just will it to be here, to be there. And it's there. Like Jesus. It'll be a body like his, he says. And he just appears where he wants to be. You think he has to take a bus or a plane or a heavenly chair or whatever to get from there to here? First John 3, 1 and 2 says, We'll be just like him. Our bodies will be fashioned like his glorious body. We know not what we'll be like, but when we see him, we'll be like him. Amen resurrected body Hallelujah! you won't have to believe for the money to pay off that house or buy a home over there because you've already got a mansion prepared for over there John 14 he said I go to prepare a place for you and I'm coming back to receive you to myself he said in my father's house are many many mansions Hallelujah. amen I'm not going to need it for over there I need all these blessed promises over here I don't have to Think about having to wake up and the first thing I do, like I do now, before I get out of bed, recite several passages out of Psalm 91 and claim everything. Cite Psalm 103 and cover all my family and you and expectant mothers and all God has given us with the blood of Jesus. I won't have to claim Psalm 91 over there as my assurance policy instead of insurance because I'll be in a place where there are no accidents, adversity, <laughs> Nothing to fear. Nothing bad can happen to me. So Psalm 91, dear friends, we're over here. Amen. The Bible is filled with those promises. James 5, over here. Prayer of faith. Matthew 6, 33, I'll meet all your needs over here. Take no thought. Food, clothing, and shelter. You won't have to worry about that over there. Psalm 91. Matthew 21, 22. Over here. Mark 11, 24. Over here. Matthew 7 says, just ask for these things. You'll get them over here. I don't read a single one of these passages where he said, now these things are not for today, they're for the past or the future. 
And memorize them good because when you get over there, you can start claiming these promises. It sounds silly to say it, but apparently that's what most people believe because they're confessing they're over there. Christians need to confess where they are in Christ, is what we're saying. Not just what they are, but where they are. What their position is in Christ. And when they come to see where he has set them, then they'll stop feeding on the husks of man's religion. They'll get out of the religious hog pen. And they'll come to themselves like the prodigal. And they'll realize they're a son of a rich father and go back and confess their unbelief and say, Lord, from this point on, I'm confessing all you say. They'll enjoy their privileges, their blessings as sons of God. It's one thing to know who your heavenly father is. It's another thing to know who you are. But I want to point out, in addition this morning, it's one thing to know where Jesus Christ is seated. It's another thing to know where you're seated. And where are you seated? Not in that seat, but as to your spiritual position, you're seated, Ephesians 2, 6, in the heavenlies with Jesus, far above all principality and power. If you know where you are, you can make those commands of authority, like we said in that message, that brother that commanded that spirit of death to leave that baby, and instantly it left. Such commands don't come from servants' quarters where most Christians are living. They come from the throne room, and that's where you are, in the throne room, by faith. Say, I'm there. I have the victory. And praise God, I don't care what I see or feel or people say. His word is true. And another case, I remember where a sister, I just said to her, I was under the anointing in a meeting, I said, whatever you speak, God's going to give you. Wow. You have to have the anointing say that to somebody. I thought she'd come for healing. She's going to speak something for herself. Raised hand, said, I claim, and she named a name that she is free from the spirit of mental illness and delivered from the mental institution. I'd hardly gotten home till I got the letter. She says, just like you said. If I speak it, God will give it to me. Said she came to herself almost immediately, and they've set her free. She's totally restored. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. That's the doctor's wife, by the way who recognized what her position was in Christ. Now, can you imagine the average Christian saying what she said? They couldn't, because such commands of authority don't come from the servants' quarters where most Christians are living. They come from the throne room where they're seated, but they don't know it, and nobody's telling them. And those of us who are trying to tell them are being called super foolish. Praise God. I knew faith was foolish to the world. And if you're super foolish, you've got super faith. <laughs> Praise God. Thirdly, we need to confess what we possess in Christ. Amen. What we are in Christ, where we are in Christ, what we possess in Christ. This has to do with our inheritance. Standing position, now inheritance. What do you have in Christ? Well, Romans 8 is a good place to start. Romans 8. Verses 16 and 17, what you have in Christ. Most people don't know what they have in Christ. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. That's what you have. You're not just an heir to something that your father on earth or your rich uncle or someone may leave you. You're an heir of God. And more, you are a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Now, dear friend, I say it in love, but some of you sit out there and say, yes, that's right, that's what I am, but you're not living like a joint heir. You're thinking, I can live so abundantly because all I have to do is uh, watch people put money in the offering box. And you have to work for yours. That's why you don't have it. Or maybe you don't rate in heaven like I do or something if you're in ministry, so you don't have the financial blessing I do. Friends, I've got so much, I don't know what to do with it. God just had to show me. And look at the offering box. I don't even know if it's back there. And... Everybody that knows me will testify to this. I don't even touch. I wouldn't know what comes in that. Someone else counts it. I couldn't care less. I'm not depending on what comes in that box. I've been walking for 25 years looking up to him who supplies it. 
if I had been in a sad state that Sunday, I got six dollars. If I was depending on that. But he supplied in other ways. I've never missed a meal in all these years. I'm a joint heir. Some of you are saying joint heirs, but dear friends, you're not living like a joint heir. Then here's another passage that tells you what you have in him. 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 3. Well, you'll never get away from this passage once you hear it. For, verse 21, all things are yours. Whether it's the world, whether it's life, whether it's death, whether it's things present, whether it's things to come, all are yours. Can everybody say that together? All things are yours. All things are yours. The world's yours. Going to get it over there? He says things present are yours as well as over there. As well as things to come. Life is yours. Death is yours. When you die, then it's all yours yet. This is the one message that will let you take it with you. <laughs> Hallelujah. There are no pockets and shrouds. You can't take those old greenbacks with you, but you can take all the resources of heaven with you. If you've got it over here, you'll carry it with you over there. All that you need will be met. It's all yours. He said the world's yours now. He said things to come are yours too. It's all yours. Now I want to tell you something that is really a secret to most people, that the devil, not God, but the devil has their possessions bound under lock and key. And they don't know what's theirs. And what they might suspect is theirs are being talked out of claiming it because they're told it's for over there, if it's not for today, or you can't believe for material blessings as well as spiritual and so on. Isn't it strange that people know what's theirs that they've paid for, but they don't know what he's paid for that's theirs? Amen. These same people that say, you know, that it's not for here and they don't know what's theirs because even though it's in the word of God, no one's taught them that it's theirs. Yet if the tax appraiser comes to their house and the tax appraisers do that sometimes for your personal property, he'll say, is that house yours you're living in? Yes, that's mine. Is that car in the garage yours? Yes, that's mine. They know what's theirs. Is that riding more yours? Yes, that's mine. I paid for that. Is that boat at the dock yours? No, the neighbor parks his boat there. He doesn't have a dock, so I let him park it there. That's not mine. This yours, yes, that's mine. That's... They know everything they've purchased. Come out of the supermarket and the thief's trying to take their tires off. Stop, that's my car. Drop it in Jesus' name or whatever. <laughs> if a thief is trying to steal their car, they know that's their car right away. They know that's my car. Maybe five of them parked just alike, same color, but they know their car is being interfered with. And yet, when Satan, whom Jesus himself called a thief in John 10, backs his moving truck up to your house and just starts stealing you blind, your peace of mind, your health, your property, your goods, your possessions, your finances, your wife, your husband, your children, just steal everything. Christians just stand by with their mouths open and never utter a sound. The Bible right here, I got it, marked down, says, resist the devil. <laughs> well, people know how to resist people stealing their car. Resist the devil. Now, I don't mean you have to go beat him up. But I don't think it's a mark of faith to walk out and see somebody trying to start your car and say, praise the Lord, I hope he gets it. <laughs> I can prove I'm humble. I can prove I've got the right spirit. I can prove I've really got Matthew 5 in my heart. They take your coat, give them your cloak also. No, you're not going to let them steal it. You're not going to force them not to. All I'm saying is right away you identify with your car and if he hasn't driven off yet, you'll invite him out. Say, would you please step out? That's mine. Do you need me to take you somewhere? Do you need me to take you somewhere? I'll drive you somewhere or whatever. And then give him a testimony. But I'm being a little facetious to make a point. We know what's ours. We know what we've paid for. Very few Christians know what he's paid for. 
And they don't want to believe it if he tells them it's theirs. Now, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. Two men who heard the same teaching, faith teaching, responded in two different ways. One, like the elder brother, refused to claim what was his. The other was living like the prodigal and came to himself when he heard the faith message, rose up and said, well, wait, I'm a son of a rich father. I don't have to accept this poverty. Yeah, I was in a meeting where I preached, you know, that God wants to bless the whole man. He loves a Christian. He doesn't want to see you living like a beggar in a cave. That isn't Bible. That's Baptist or whatever, but it isn't Bible. We could have said Presbyterian, but you get the point. So he and his wife heard the message one day. I was there for several days, and she came in the next day giving me that good edifying testimony about what he said about what he didn't agree with. And I generally, if I can get through to people, you can keep those negative confessions to yourself. Ephesians 4 says, speak only that which edifies your brother. I've had people come up here after saying just that and say, I know you don't want to hear it, but... And then they go on and give it to you. So I just praise the Lord that this proves that I can overcome So she said, let me tell you what he said. He said, he doesn't agree with you on financial blessing. She said, in fact, he said, I don't care what he says. I don't believe God wants to bless me financially. Well, I said, he won't. He won't, that's right. Because if you don't believe it, he won't. Another brother going bankrupt, both Christians. I'm talking about Christians. Going bankrupt. I don't know how he got to the meeting because he certainly didn't know there was going to be faith preached because he sat there and disagreed with it. Because Christians, charismatics as well, have never heard of the abundant life. All they've heard about is, you know, you're spiritual if you're poor and all that, what we used to teach. So I was preaching along the line that God wants to bless the whole man, bless you in every way. And I gave an example of how I claimed $1,500 to go to Israel. He came back a year later. I was back a year later and he came up and gave a testimony is how I learned this. He said when he said God gave him $1,500 by faith, he said chicken feet said to himself. He wasn't too happy anyway because he was going bankrupt. Chicken feed, I need $150,000. He wasn't going bankrupt, he was. They were foreclosing. $150,000. He said, I'd no sooner uttered the thought to myself to Brother Freeman said, it doesn't matter whether it's 1500 or 150000 It's all the same to God. He said it nearly knocked him off the chair. It's just like God had slapped him in the face and said, listen, I sent him here and you here to get you together. He's got the word to meet your need. Isn't that silly for us to spend a week in preparation for something or a lifetime or 25 years? I've been in this faith walk for 25 years. To go into a city and for people to come who don't agree with anything you say. God isn't missing it. Either I'm in the wrong city or they're missing it by not listening. So he said, when I said that, $150,000, just like God spoke directly to him, he said, then he got out his pencil and started listening and taking notes, N-O-T-E-S, notes, <laughs> writing down the scriptures, writing down the passages. He didn't ask me a question. He didn't have to. He had it there. He said, I went home and looked up those scriptures he was rattling off for that hour and a half that I speak. And he said, you know, it was in the Word. It was there. It was in the Word. He said, praise God, then I'm not bankrupt. And in 30 days, he's testifying a year later, he says, in 30 days, God supplied every penny. He wasn't going bankrupt, he was. Two men heard the same faith teaching, and yet one, like so many, refused to believe God wanted to bless him in every way. I don't know why it is it's so hard for Christians to believe that God wants to bless them financially and physically as well as spiritually. Why is it any harder for you to believe Matthew 6.33 than John 3.16? Same God said it. It's in the same word. Why is it any harder? I just believed them both when I got saved because I was going bankrupt. When I got saved, I believed John 3.16 and saw Matthew 6.33 said, Look, my son, if you seek first now the kingdom of God, you won't go bankrupt. I didn't. Haven't. Don't plan on. Not to claim what he's promised means you don't believe him. Third John 2 tells you, Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. In Mark chapter 10, 
when Jesus said it's going to be very difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, well, Peter said, Lord, then who can be saved? And then he went on to say, with men it's impossible, with God it's possible to even save a rich man. That is, if he meets the conditions. Then Peter went on to say, but Lord, we've forsaken all for you. And Jesus answered and said, and you ought to mark that one down, Mark chapter 10, verses 27 and following, it's in the Word, and I just sometimes don't give anybody but this when they come with their doubts and questions about God's willingness to bless them financially. I just say, go home and read Mark 10. I won't even tell you the verses. It's there. You'll find it. Pay the cost. Just read. And if you'll read it, Jesus said there's no one that's forsaken his houses, his property, his goods for my sake, but that in this life, in the present time, will receive houses and lands and in the life to come eternal life. He said in this world, with persecutions, yes, you'll get the blessings too. You'll get the blessings with the blessings. He said, Every man that forsakes all, he says, I'll give it back to him a hundredfold houses and lands. You can't say that's spiritual houses and spiritual lands because he contrasts that with the spiritual state. Because he said, in this life, in the present world, you'll get that in the world to come, eternal life. Now, dear friends, I point out to you that he said that. I didn't. I not only didn't say it, I didn't write it. He said it, the one you say you believe in. And when you say, I don't believe that he will meet this big debt or heal this condition or do this or that that he's promised in the word, you're saying two things, I don't believe you. You might as well point your finger at the throne and say that. It's as clear as John 3.16, James 5, healing. It's as clear as John 3.16, Matthew 6.33, I'll meet all your needs. You're saying, one, I don't believe you, and secondly, you're saying, you just sent Jesus to the cross in vain for me at that point. If it is true, as we're told in Isaiah 53 and Matthew 8.16 and 17, that Jesus bore your sicknesses and your pains as well as your sins, if it's true, as Isaiah 53, Matthew 8, 16 and 17 says, that the Father laid on him all of this. If it's true, as his word says in many passages, that he's not only provided that healing for you, but promised it again and again, he promises it. Mark 16, James 5. If that's true, that he's provided and promised, and then when you have a need, you don't believe and claim the meeting of that need supernaturally direct from the throne room, then you're saying to God, I don't believe I don't believe what you're saying. And you're saying, as far as I'm concerned, Jesus suffered and died in vain. At that point, at that point. And then you get real pious and say, but I believe that he bore my sins and I'm on the way. Maybe you are, maybe you're not. I won't give you any assurance. You may be ignorant of your inheritance, that's one thing, but to read the plain teaching of the word especially when it is expounded to you as clearly as it is in this body. And then to say, I don't believe it, you're not hurting us, you're hurting yourself. You're saying to God, I don't believe you. You're not saying you don't believe Hobart. If I read you the promise of healing and you don't appropriate it when you have a need, it isn't a question of whether or not you believe us or this church. You're saying to God, I don't believe you. I just don't want to believe you. I'm going to stay with the word, friends. I hope you do too. I don't care how much anyone says that we're foolish here. It talks about the foolishness of our faith. I'm not going to rob God of the glorious promises that he's made us by treating them with the disrespect that most Christians do. I'm not going to treat his word with such disrespect, with such contempt. I don't care how foolish they call us. If his word is clear, let him write a hundred articles like the one was that we've got not super faith here, but super foolishness. Saying that we're super foolish because we believe God heals by the prayer of faith alone. And the article said, no, he heals through the doctors, medicines, and surgeons. That's the way he heals. And sometimes maybe an instantaneous or supernatural miracle. I don't care what they say. They could write that a hundred times. They could plaster it all over the highways. Because the time is soon coming when it'll be shown who the foolish really are. 
those who are denying that healing is in the atonement to the extent that they don't appropriate it and then running around teaching others not to believe the word of God are going to be begging one of these days soon for God to touch them, God to heal them, God to save them, God to spare them. And he won't do it because they don't have the faith for it. He's only going to hear those. He only hears faith, in fact. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. Amen. He can't hear anything but faith. And it'll be too late for them to get faith. Because you don't get faith in a moment. Faith comes by hearing the word. Amen. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his arm, says the word of God. Blessed is the man whose trust is in the Lord, Jeremiah 17. Oh, you don't have to apologize for your faith. Confess in the fourth place what you can do in Christ. What you are, where you are, what you have, what you can do. This is your power. This is your authority that's been delegated to you. Confess what you can do in Christ. You know better than your confession about these things. What can you do? I don't know. I know what I can do. Let me give you my confession. Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Christ. Praise God. <laughs> now, if that's your confession, that's good. But if it's just in your head, it still won't work. But you've got to start with your head. Most people, their face in their head, and I'm not knocking that. First time you hear something that you haven't heard before, especially first time you heard a faith message, it's in your head. A little mustard seed of it may get on your heart and you get a healing in that same meeting and that sort of thing. <laughs> so as you keep confessing what you are, what you can do, where you are, and all of that, it's going to get out of your head into your heart. Confess what you can do in Christ. Don't be afraid to confess what you can do. You know what you can't do. You'd be surprised what I can't do. But I can do all things in Christ. Most people, you hear they're confessing what they can't do. I can't sing. I can't testify. I just can't give up these cigarettes. It's a habit has got me bound. I can't get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I just can't have faith for this or that. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. And wonder why they can't. <laughs> Proverbs 6.2 tells them you're snared by the words of your mouth. I'm amazed at full gospel meetings how many people get up and testify they can't. They're generally in the place of leadership or they're there to entertain us. I mean, to bless us, supposedly to bless us. How many times have I heard singers get up? Now, I can't sing. You pray for me. One woman said, that I've been battling laryngitis for about three days and I don't think I'm going to be able to sing this, but I'll try. You pray for me. She didn't have to tell us she couldn't sing. <laughs> if you can't sing you don't have to tell him buddy they'll learn of it soon enough it was like she said she got what she confessed as one brother said he's been feeling faint all day and Oh, he just went on and on. He was a leader in full gospel meeting where I was speaking. Oh, he said, I'm so sick. He said, I just might faint before I get through this. And I started edging over because I, <laughs> I, was, I was sitting by him, getting ready to speak on faith. He was big. He weighed a, too much to fall on me. He's talking about... <laughs> I know people often get what they confess when it's negative as well as positive. I did. I expect to see him drop just flat on his face right there. And I didn't know which way he might fall. <laughs> I was in another church. Oh, I could go on all day about these confessions. I can't, I can't. As one brother said, we heard her practicing before the meeting. said, it's the voice of an angel. And yet that sister with that beautiful voice, when she got up before the message, now folks, I'm going to try to sing this. I don't know how to come out. But you pray for me. You pray for me while I try. Beautiful in the rehearsal. And she just loused the whole thing up. Stumbled all through. Why? She didn't believe she could. She wasn't looking to him. She was looking to her. Oh, praise God for what people say I can do in Christ. You can never do any more than you believe you can do. 
you find out a lot of times you just have to take something back you said, I can't. You don't dare say you can't. Some things, if I was allowed to, I'd say I can't. But I know that I'm not allowed or I'll be disobedient to him. Because he said, you go do that. And the flesh says you can't. But he says, go do it. And so then I say I can because he said I can. So we're not talking about it's easy. Where did we ever tell you it's easy? Faith is easy. We didn't say the exercise was of faith. Faith is the easiest thing in the world to have. It's simply believing God. You've got a choice out there. I either believe what he said here in James 5, Matthew 6, 33, or whatever, or you don't. That's what faith is. I believe it or I don't. But through the trial sometimes of getting a manifestation, you may have to find out the difference between head faith and heart faith. So we didn't say it was easy walking it out. But, you know, God designed it that way. Again, I didn't. I suppose we're human enough that we try to make as easy as possible on people. But we can't do it. Moses said, listen, Moses. You know who Moses was? None like Moses in the Old Testament. He was God's chosen choice. Said, I can't speak. You know what? He couldn't. Exodus 4. I'd like you to look at that. You're in no hurry since you're in glory barn. Exodus 4, verse 10. We always tell people in a hurry, you must have accidentally stumbled in here because we're in no hurry. Exodus 4 and verse 10. And Moses said to the Lord, this is after the Lord appeared to him and he's sending him to Egypt. O Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither here before. And not since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. In other words, he said, I couldn't speak before, and nothing's changed since you've commissioned me. I can feel with him a little there. Because first time I heard myself on a tape recorder in a speech class, I couldn't believe it. I didn't think I was the best speaker in the world before I heard myself, but after I heard it, I know what Moses is going through here. And when the Lord called me to preach, he didn't change anything. I'm believing for better things, but some of you could outshout me with just clearing your throat. <laughs> but the Lord said, go preach, and so I don't worry about the voice, and I don't do what Moses did, and I'm not trying to make a comparison here, but he said, I wasn't eloquent before, and nothing's changed since you anointed me. He said, I'm slow of speech, and of a slow tongue. Well, look at what the Lord said. Who has made man's mouth are the dumb or the deaf, or the seeing, or the blind. Have I not the Lord? Take the whole revelation with verse 11. We won't pause there. Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. He didn't say I'll make you eloquent. That's flesh. He said I'll be with your mouth. I'll teach you what to say. And old Moses didn't have the faith for that. He said, oh my Lord, send somebody else. Send, I pray thee, by the hand of whom thou wilt send. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, well, if you say you can't, you can't. So he said, I'll send there. And there's your brother. I'll make him your prophet. You'll be as God to him. I'll speak to you. You speak to him. And then he'll go be your prophet. Now there is the outstanding leader of the Old Testament who led those three millions or better out of Egypt and was the lawgiver and lived to be 120 and was God's chosen. No one had better talk against Moses because Numbers 12, both Miriam, his sister, and Aaron, his brother, were severely rebuked by the Lord for criticizing Moses about something. But when Moses said, I can't speak, he couldn't. God, the sovereign God of heaven, to work those tremendous miracles through him in Egypt, those ten great plagues, the like of which the world has never seen a man with the power of miracles like Moses had, parted the Red Sea by raising his rod. Said, I can't, and he couldn't, and God would not overcome man's reluctance. Now, you're not Moses, I'm not Moses, and if he won't overcome Moses' reluctance, he's not going to overcome yours. You're going to have to believe and say, I can do all things through Christ. So before you criticize him, God just may say to you, son, daughter, tomorrow I'm sending you to Washington to perform ten plagues. 
before you criticize Moses for not wanting to go speak because he wasn't eloquent, don't do it because God has a way of keeping us in line. He just may say, go stand before the president. I'll get you in, then you stand before him, and then you deliver this message. Well, no one's rushing, you see, to go do that. But they'll go stand in faith assembly and say, thus saith the Lord. Well, praise God. It's one thing to say it here. It's another thing to go to Egypt. God isn't going to overcome your reluctance. I remember hearing Mars Cirillo years ago tell on a tape, how in his meetings, and God had given him the gifts of healing, word of knowledge, but he'd say, I'd tell people because he thought he was glorifying God doing it, I couldn't heal a fly of a headache. This is all God, all God. I couldn't heal a fly of a headache. People think they're glorifying God because they confess what they can't do. You should say, I can do all things through Christ, to be sure. But he said, in a meeting, he was in his motel room praying when he said the Lord appeared to him. I mean, you know, just right there. And said, my son, you're doing something that displeases me. Now he's not getting an impression about anything because he thinks he's right in what he's doing. The Lord is there talking to him. You're doing something displeased. He said, he began to weep and cry, Lord, I thought I was doing everything, you know, by your grace, doing everything I could the way you wanted to please you. He said, what am I doing that would cause, you know, you to come down here and talk directly to me? He said, in your meetings... Now listen carefully out there. You need it. He said, in your meetings, you're telling people you can't heal. You're saying, I can't heal. He said, as long as you think you can't, you can't. You better think about what you're saying when you say, I can't, even though you think you're helping God out. He said, as long as you think you can't, you can't. He said, that displeases me for a man to go in a meeting and say, I can't heal. That doesn't minister faith to anybody. Have you never read the word? What Peter said in Acts 3, silver and gold have a none, but such as God gives you, I'm going to pray if he'll let you have a little. No, he said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have. I have it. I have the power to heal. I have the gift of healing. I give to you in the name of Jesus arise and walk. He said, I have it. He wasn't taking any credit or glory from God. That's what's wrong with this old dead charismatic church. They're afraid to step out boldly and say, thus saith the Lord, I will do greater works because he said I would. He said, John 14, 12, that we would do greater works. Why are we afraid to say that? He said you will. He said, in my name, you will go lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. He didn't say, I'll heal them just because you tell them healings in the atonement. He said, you lay hands on them. I'll heal through you. Tell them that you have the gift of healing in that hand. I tell people I do. He's anointed that hand. Not in my right hand, in my left hand. And I've seen it confirmed too many times. In fact, he's confirmed it to others, directly appearing to them. But I don't go by others' visions. It just confirms what I already know. I'm not afraid to tell people. I held my hand up once in a meeting and said, I never start a sermon that way, but I said, the Lord wants me to say this. He's anointed that hand with the gifts of healing. Now you believe the word you hear, he will minister healing to you through that hand. Amen. Tell them what he said. That's in his word. You could go forth and say the same things. You wouldn't have to say he gave me the gift of healing. If you say, God will anoint these hands when I lay hands on you, Mark 16. You can be the least member in the body and say that, and that's true. For he said, in my name, you. These signs follow believers, not apostles, merely Jews, first century, people in Palestine, evangelists or somebody. These signs follow believers. My name, you lay hands on the sick and they will recover. The next night, a girl came to me and she said, you know, when you held up your hand, said, I was lying in my bedroom praying, a young girl in college, and said, the Lord appeared to me. I said, you remember when my servant held up his hand, said, I've anointed that hand with the gifts of healing? He said, I'm going to anoint your hands too, and you're going to minister to the sick. Well, let's say I don't need that confirmation. I already have it. The anointing's there. It's just like a charge of electricity when it's there. Now, don't try to copy that. It's generally both hands with people. 
I've never felt anything in there but just hair or something if I lay hands on their head. I'm not afraid to tell people that, but I don't go around boasting about it. You very seldom hear me mention it, but I'll tell you, dear friends, I have said sometimes the anointing is here. You come for your healing. That's what it meant. That's what it meant. Mark 16, in my name you, in my name you. Confess what you know in Christ. What you know. This is your testimony. Confess what's been accomplished. I'm talking about experiential knowledge. What you know. Paul said in 2 Timothy 1 and 12, I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep that that I've committed to him. He knew that. Romans 8, 28, we know that all things are working together for our good. Now, if you've experienced that, you know it. If you've just heard us quote it, or you've just quoted it, it's still in the head, not the heart. We're talking about confess what you know because you've experienced it. Your testimony. You get on a plane because you believe the pilot knows something about his business. You wouldn't stay very long if he announced, this is my first flight. Any of you back there know how to pray, you better pray. <laughs> you take your watch to the jeweler because you know he knows what he's doing. You believe it anyway. Sometimes you wonder about the automobile mechanic. We've got a window we've had in the garage so many times on the Mercury. I'm not sure they know how to fix it. We believe they know it when we take it to another garage. Now, don't get into that. Why don't you claim it, Bit? There's some things you just have to rise above. Hear the whole message. I don't know why it isn't fixed yet. I've been fasting, praying about it. But generally, you take your car because you believe they know. So Satan is overcome by your confessing what you know. You know about the Holy Spirit, don't you? Then confess it. You know because you've experienced it. Healing, salvation... Confession of what you know. Revelation 12, 11, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. I mean, Satan will keep you bound with sickness if you don't know healing's for you. He kept me bound till I learned it was for me. He'll keep you bound and confused and full of doubt and fear in your mind if you don't know that a Christian doesn't have to suffer that. Isaiah 27, 3 promises you peace. 1 Peter 5 promises you that you have to have no cares. He'll bear them all. He'll keep you bound in finances as long as you don't know. Matthew 6.33 or Philippians 4.19 My God will supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. So you're testifying here confessing to what he's accomplished in your life. That'll set you free. It'll set others free. You know, here's something. When you're going through a trial, I've done this. If you start relating to the Lord, worshiping him, Confessing it loud enough, the devil can hear it. Of course, he could hear anyway. Reciting those things he's done for you. Oh, your faith will increase. Amen. Remember those other times he healed you or met that need two days after the deadline or whatever. And your testimony will quicken the faith in others about what he's done. Experiential knowledge I'm talking about. I testified in a full gospel meeting about how I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I didn't have a teacher to tell me I didn't have to seek and tarry. And so for three weeks, I did everything you don't do to receive the baptism. And then finally, after I tried everything else, I said, well, I'll do what apparently I haven't done yet. I'll act my faith. And so I acted my faith and it happened. That is, I began to give my voice to the Holy Spirit because I believed I had received. Felt foolish for two minutes and felt quite elated for two hours and ever since. He heard me giving that testimony that I just simply received because I acted my faith. He came back the next month and gave his testimony saying, I've been seeking the Holy Ghost. He was a pastor. I've been seeking the Holy Ghost for years. I've been prayed for years. Nothing ever happens. When I heard him testify how that it's a simple act of faith, act your faith, he said, I determined that was it. I wasn't going up there for any more prayer. He'd been prayed for too many times. He said, I decided to do what he said he did. So I went home, knelt down by the bed, said, Father, I believe I have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and immediately began speaking in tongues. Now, God didn't force tongues out of him. He did what he heard me testify to, act his faith. Oh, but I don't know what to say. Oh, but that's just me. All of these things people say, or I don't want to be making it up. How do I know it's God or some other spirit? Well, how do you know it's not some other spirit when you invited Jesus into your heart? 
Have you ever looked in there to see which spirit it is? That's nonsense. That just says, I don't believe the word of God. He said in Luke eleven thirteen, if you ask for the Holy Spirit, your father will give you the Holy Spirit. Not a stone, not a serpent, not a scorpion, but the very bread you're asking for is what you'll get. So it's just a question, do you believe God? Psalm 105. One and two. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. He didn't say keep it a secret when he healed you. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing unto him. Sing psalms unto him. Talk ye of all his wondrous works. I had a man say that it's nobody's business that God healed me. He's never testified to it. He says, that's my business. That's between me and the Lord. It's too personal to talk about. Psalm 105 says, tell of his wondrous works. Tell them all. You keep them a secret and God may keep something about you a secret. Then sixthly, we're talking about there, confess what he's done. Sixthly, confess where you're going with Christ. Where you're going with Christ. Where you're going. Well, if you're an overcomer, you're going into battle and into victory. Revelation 19, 7 to 15 says you're going into battle and into victory. That's where you're going if you're an overcomer. Amen. Here Jesus, of course, appears... Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him from the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith, Unto me these are the true sayings of God. And I fell down at his feet to worship him. And he said, See thou do it not. I am a fellow servant of thy brethren. And have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And then I saw heaven open. Now keep in mind. The saints are arrayed in white fine linen. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Logos of God, the Word of God. The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, clean and white. That's precisely what he said in verse 7 of the saints. We're going into war. And out of his mouth goeth forth a sharp sword. Say, how are you going into war? From heaven because you've been caught up out of tribulation. And you're coming back to war. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. And with it that he should smite the nations and should rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the wine press of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of the heavens, Come and gather yourself together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of the kings, the flesh of the captains, the flesh of the mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Amen. That last verse we read is victory for those who are following the Lord in their white linen and on the horses. Where are you going? Well, the importance of the faith message is to be seen that as you are now overcoming Satan by your faith, you're being prepared for warfare in the battle of the ages that's about to begin. Amen. Amen. We're going into warfare and victory. And then lastly, we're to confess what we will be in Christ. What we will be in Christ. Well, one thing will be in his fullness. Ephesians 3 and 4. In his fullness. 
We're growing up now through the end time message, through the word of God. We're growing up now into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. He said he's preparing us. He can't do those other things until he first brings us into maturity as his sons. Secondly, we're going to be in his image. In his fullness, secondly, in his image. 1 John 3, 2. We know not what we shall be like, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. We're going to be in his image when he appears. Glorified bodies. Thirdly, what we will be, we'll be in the throne with him. Revelation 3.21, overcomers, he says of overcomers, I'll grant to sit in my throne with me, even as I overcame and my father did grant me to sit in the throne with him. That's where we're going. You know, I read quite frequently how a number of people are doing this, spending large sums of money and writing it into their wills to have their bodies frozen in hope of restoration because they think eventually science is developing at such a rapid pace they'll discover what it is killing man. Well, I could save them all the money and trouble, tell them to read Romans 5. Sin. But they're spending large sums of money and a number have already had their bodies quick frozen and wrapped in Reynolds wrap. Literally true. And packed away and kept in a deep freeze because they say by the turn of the year 2000 or maybe before or at least a little after, if they find a cure for what's killing men and what killed those individuals, then they can restore them. Well, dear friend, I hope your faith is in more than restoration. No, Christians aren't hoping for restoration, but resurrection. Or change, depending on where your faith's at. In this end time? No, we're not hoping for restoration. Who wants to be restored to the same old body, natural body subject to the same old pains and aches and sicknesses and death again? So confess what you're going to be. I'm going to be glorified like him. I'm going to sit with him in his throne. I'm going to be in his fullness. The fullness of God in Christ. I'm going to be in that fullness. Ephesians 3 and 4. Now, Confessing one or two things is nice, but you know, some people fail as overcomers because they confess one thing now or something else a little later. They're only confessing one thing or two or three things. A confession, keep in mind, is confession of all that God has done and going to do. It's like a stick. You can take a stick the size of your finger and break it. I don't care how tough it is. Anybody that's not next door to death could break a stick. Some of us can break two sticks as big as our finger. And occasionally maybe three, depending on what kind of wood. But you put all seven of those sticks we gave you today together. See, the devil breaks a confession sometimes in people because that's all they're confessing. That's that one thing. I'm healed or I believe I'm healed or whatever. They should be confessing the whole bit. Their position, their standing, what they are, what they can do. And he can't break that. Why take it a step at a time? Just say all of that's mine this morning. I'm going to confess it all. I do possess it all. And I'm going to get every bit that's still in the head down at the heart because I'm going to confess it till I feel that it's down there. You can feel it down there. To use a spiritual expression. You know when it's there. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Would you stand with me? Father, in Jesus' name, we confess not only what we have, but what we are and what we shall be in Christ as our possession, as our inheritance, as joint heirs with Jesus, and will not be turned aside from our confession, though all the devils in hell oppose it, and tell us that we can't confess what is our rights and our inheritance, even charismatics telling us that we can't confess things as rights and as inheritance, this is presumption. But Lord, your word says it's faith, and that we receive only what we believe and confess and know, is ours. We do not possess what we do not believe and confess. So our confession is that all of these things are ours and as you show us more, we will appropriate them by faith. Hallelujah. Help your people 
to be a people of God, an example to this community, to the whole charismatic community, to the world, to the institutional church, to their families, to their friends, to their fellow employees, to their employers, to God in heaven, to the angels, to the devils in hell, that they are sons of God, ready to be manifested, maturing into His image, into His likeness, into His fullness. God grant that each of us will confess and possess all that's ours, so that we'll not stand before you one day and hear, to one well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of the Lord, and then to have to hear to another, why did you not believe? It was so plain. Why did you not believe? God help us. God help us to act on what we know is true. Your word. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Blessed be the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whatever we're going to sing, the message was for over here. The song will be for over here. Amen, that's right. If you want this church to minister to you, why don't you come and make that good confession of faith in Christ or that good Amen. confession, you'll be baptized in the Spirit of that good confession, you'll be healed as soon as we lay hands on your head. Or to confess to Him where you are, these things, however, Amen. and possess them. Hallelujah. Praise Him. Oh!